Good day, everyone, and welcome to PrimePay's webinar titled Avoiding Wage and Hour Complaints, a Guide to Compliant Pay, including today's insights for the gig economy. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Jackson. I'm the Senior Vice President of our Broker Concierge Partner Program here at PrimePay, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Before we get started, allow me to cover some of the logistics for today's webinar. Today's session is pre-recorded. And for that reason, we have muted everyone's lines. But that does not mean that we do not want to hear from you. As we go through the content today, I am sure that you will have some questions to be addressed, and our HR advisory team would love to provide you with the answers. To type in your question, please go directly into the Go to Meeting menu bar and into the question box. You can type in your question at any time throughout the webinar. We have also created a hashtag, PrimePayHR that you may also use to make your comments or ask questions directly through Facebook or Twitter. If we are unable to address your specific question during the webinar, no worries. Upon completion of the webinar, we will have someone from our PrimePay team reach out to you directly and provide answers to your questions. Now, the most popular questions we receive are about the availability of the recording and presentation slide deck. In our follow-up email to you, we will be providing a copy of the link to the recording and also a copy of the slide deck. So type in your questions as we would love to hear from you. Today's webinar is approved for one continuing education credit for those seeking SHRM and HRCI credits. And we will provide the continuing education credit codes to you at the end of the session today. We're excited to bring today's rich and practical content to you. It's brought to you by our partner, ThinkHR. The ThinkHR team powers our HR advisory solution, which is an integrated suite of HR knowledge, compliance tools, and training solutions supported by live experts. Let's now turn this over to our speakers as they will cover important subjects like the new white collar exemptions and overtime regulations, joint employment standards, and equal pay initiatives. At the end of our webcast, I will share some additional details as to our follow-up emails and the additional resources that we will provide for those attending today. Good morning and welcome to Avoiding Wage and Hour Complaints. Thank you for joining us today. There's a lot going on in the world of wage and hour issues, including Department of Labor proposals regarding white collar exemptions and joint employment standards that have been released just this spring. So we will dive right in. Uh, first, I want to introduce you to our presenters who are both wage and hour experts. We're very lucky to have them here today. Ellen Kearns is a partner at Constangie Brooks, Smith & Profet, who is our legal partner at ThinkHR. She is the head of the Boston office, and she's also Constangie's Wage and Hour Practice Group co-chair. Renee Farrell is a seasoned HR expert. She's a live advisor at ThinkHR, and she does have a certified compensation professional certification in addition to her SHRM. Uh, credentials, so she also really knows what she's talking about. I'm Rachel Sobel. I'll simply be moderating today. So on to the agenda. We have a packed agenda. It's filled with explanations of evolving wage and hour laws and practical tips for how you can be compliant with these changing regulations. We're going to start with the news that we've all been anticipating for the last couple of years, white collar exemptions. New regulations were proposed on March 7th, raising the salary threshold, along with making some other changes. We'll explain everything you need to know, well, or at least some of it, but we've got some resources for you to download to give you some deeper information. Next up is joint employment standards, for which new regulations were just proposed on April 1st, so we'll give you the latest news on that. Following is the gig economy, which is growing rapidly, with as many as one in five workers engaged in it. And while federal regulation in this area is still pretty sparse, a few key states have passed more stringent classification regulations that other states are sure to consider adopting themselves. Then we're going to talk about regulations affecting tipped workers. In 2018, we saw federal changes to the 20% rule and some regulations prohibiting management from collecting tips. And then when you add in a patchwork of state laws regarding tip credits and tip pooling, this topic can get pretty complicated. So we'll let you know what you need to know about that. 
We're going to finish up with a brief discussion on equal pay regulation. Um, at the federal level, um, a few things have been going on, but um, one of them is on March 4th, um, EEO-1 pay data collection was put back on the table. And at the local level, many states and jurisdictions are passing salary history bans and pay transparency laws. And we'll explain how these things have the potential to move the needle on equal pay and what you need to know to be compliant. We'll just wrap up with some key takeaways that you can use. So um, before we dive in, I have a question for Ellen and Renee. Um, so why is it so important to take a people risk management approach to these issues uh, to ensure that you're compliant with them? And what are the consequences of not understanding the regulations and making wage and hour mistakes? So from my perspective, it's really about ensuring compliance because the penalties can be steep. One misclassification can open a class action suit or open up the company's books to um, auditors or agencies looking at everything and can be a very hefty penalty for the employer. Very risky. I concur in what Renee is saying, and I just caution you that uh, it's no excuse to say, I didn't know about the law, I didn't know about the legal changes. Uh, you're responsible uh, for keeping up with the law, and uh, you could be penalized for three years of back pay in a class action uh, if you have made a mistake with respect to the exemptions, uh, compensable time, or other issues we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to turn now to a discussion of the white collar exemptions. Let me begin by saying in 2004, the Department of Labor set a salary level to be an exempt white collar worker at 4.55 a week or 23,660 a year. And in addition to setting that salary level in 2004, they set out some standard duties for each of the exemptions, executive administrative, and professionals. And those of you in HR know that these standard duties essentially have a primary duty test. And if the worker meets the primary duty test, then they're on their way to be considered exempt. Twelve years later, in 2016, the Department of Labor, under a new president and a new DOL administration, uh, looked at the 455 a week and said it was too low, it has to be fixed. And so they uh, set a salary um, by looking at the bottom 40% of the full-time salary workers and came up with a salary of 913 a week or 47476 Almost immediately, this new salary level of 913 was challenged in the federal courts. And in uh, 2016, just before the new salary level was set to go into effect, a U.S. District Court in the Eastern District of Texas found the new salary level to be unlawful. Uh, although the Department of Labor appealed that decision, it asked the court to hold that decision on hold until it could look into the matter. Because by that time, there was a new president and a new Department of Labor. And the new Department of Labor issued what's called a request for information in which it asked all of the groups uh, involved in uh, setting wage and hour salaries to give some input to the Department of Labor as to what the new salary level should be. And this is what the department found. All commenters in the request for information and all those who spoke personally to the Department of Labor's listening sessions agreed that the salary level of 455 per week was too low. Most commenters to the listening session and most listening session attendees favored a simple single wide salary level over a varying region specific level and urged the department not to return to the past practice of setting different salary levels for executive, administrators, and professionals. So after considering all the comments in the listening sessions, the department decided to use the methodology that it had used back in 2004. And that methodology required it to look at the salaried employees, including non-exempt salaried employees, and 
drawing a slice at the 20th percentile of two subpopulations, salaried employees in the South and salaried employees in the retail industry. And uh, so as a result of doing that, it came up with a new salary level of 679 a week or 35,308. And it used 2017 data uh, to initially come up with a number, and then it boosted that number up a little bit to account for 2018 data, which would be likely to have increased over the 2017 data. So this new salary level of 679 a week or 35,308 will go into effect on January 1, 2020. However, before it goes into effect, the public gets a chance to comment on this new salary level. And so um, you have until uh, approximately 60 days after um, March, and so it's a date in May, to make some comments on this new salary level. And uh, we encourage you to do so if it's something that you would like to uh, make a comment on. One of the uh, uh, salary level uh, issues is that they decided, uh, unlike in past years, to uh, permit 10% of the total salary level to be met by non-discretionary bonuses and commissions. And uh, the reason that they did that is that they feel that in this day and age and in this economy, many people get uh, bonuses as part of their annual compensation and that that should be credited when trying to decide if someone were an exempt employee. Uh, the uh, listening sessions uh, also supported uh, the, the addition of having a bonus as part of the $35,000 number. One of the things they did, and I just wanted to call this to your attention, is they did not touch the duties test. So the 2004 duties test is still in effect and still in play. And so uh, if you change your employee's status from exempt to non-exempt, don't use the duties as a, a reason for doing so because those duties didn't change. The duties test didn't change. Uh, in this new regulation. Uh, one of the other things that happened in the new regulations is that it looked at the issue of how can we update this level? Should we update it uh, every year, every two years, or what? And so rather than coming up with a methodology for updating, what it said is it, it wants to propose that every uh, fourth year that they will propose an opportunity to update the salary level by notice and comment, which means similar to the way they're doing it now, they would come up with the new salary level and they would allow the public to comment on it. So uh, this also is different because up until this year, there's been no methodology at the DOL to regularly update the salary basis test. Finally, they did three other things that I wanted to call your attention to. As you know, in 2004, highly compensated employees as a concept was introduced by the Department of Labor. And the salary level in 2004 was 100000 And using the same methodology that the Department of Labor used in 2004 to come up with 100000 they now have increased the salary level for highly compensated to 147,414. Another thing they looked at was they recognized that the 2016 salary proposal of the Obama administration's DOL was having a horrible effect on the economies of the uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, and American Samoa. So as a result, they decided to freeze the salary level for exempt employees in those territories at 455. And in American Samoa, they kept it at 380. And finally, they increased the base rate for persons in the production, motion picture industry at $1,036 a week. So I'm going to talk briefly about the use of bonus or commissions that's permitted to be um, able to use to meet the minimum salary threshold. 
Under the Department of Labor's latest proposed rules, a non-discretionary bonus and or commissions paid on an annual or more frequent basis could satisfy up to 10% of the st standard exempt salary level for the white collar exemption. So instead of guaranteeing a salary of $679 per week to reach the threshold, an employer could pay the employee a salary of 611.10 per week, which is 90% of the weekly minimum salary threshold, and pay out bonuses or commissions that equal at least 10% of the 35,308. But essentially what that means is that the bonus becomes guaranteed because it must be paid in order for you to meet the minimum salary threshold test. So is that really your business intent? So give that some thought before relying on the 10% rule. It works well for employees who regularly and customarily receive bonuses or commissions that are at least 10% of the salary threshold, but if bonuses or commissions are sporadic or not guaranteed, this could be risky. And then let's, let's define what a non-discretionary bonus is, because this is the only type of bonus that's permitted. It's tied to a measurable objective, such as productivity, revenue, achievement of goals, length of service, or an other measurable factor. And while annual bonuses based on time with the company or company profits are considered to be non-discretionary, they may not be used to apply to the 10% rule to the employee's salary for the purpose of overtime exemption. And also, of course, spot bonuses, which are discretionary, um, are not included to be qualified to meet the salary threshold. I want to talk about uh, going over the white collar exemption rules. We need to stress to everyone that this is not only about an employee who is paid a fixed salary, but it's also employers need to ensure that the employees pass the job duties test to qualify them as an exempt from overtime. I want to note that when I talk to our clients on the phone, I know for a fact that many of our clients believe that just because an individual is paid a salary, they must also be exempt from overtime, and that is not correct. The term salary is merely in a method of payment. It does not mean that the employee is exempt. Earning a fixed salary that is equal to or greater than the minimum salary threshold is only the first step in determining whether an employee is exempt from overtime. The job duties test must also be passed. So that's what I want to focus on on this slide. Under the white collar exemption rules, employees must meet one of the exemption categories as outlined on the slide. And they are the executive exemption, the administrative exemption, the learned professional exemption, or the creative professional exemption. Now we have a note here that certain states, specifically California and New York, have a more restrictive requirement for exemption under their own white collar rules. Their salary thresholds for overtime exemption is already above the federal proposed amount. So your exempt employees in those states will not be impacted by the federal ruling. But specifically with regard to the job duties test, let's do a quick review because I know this is a question that we are asked often on the HR advisor hotline. The first one I want to mention is the executive exemption. Under that category, the employee must be compensated on a salary basis at a fixed rate, not less than the proposed $679 per week. The employee's primary duties must be managing the enterprise or managing a customarily recognized department or subdivision of the enterprise. The employee must customarily and regularly direct the work of at least two or more other employees or their equivalents and the employee must have the authority to hire or fire other employees, or the employee's recommendations on the hiring and firing of other employees must be given particular weight. The second category is the administrative exemption. This is the one, in my opinion, that is most frequently misunderstood, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Under the administrative exemption, in addition to meeting the minimum salary threshold, the employee's primary duty must be that of the performance of office or non-manual work directly related to the management or general business operations. The employee's primary duty includes the exercise of discretion and independent judgment with respect to matters of significance. And that's the part that most frequently is misunderstood, in my opinion. In a moment, I'm gonna, gonna drill down to what discretion and independent judgment and matters of significance really means. But the next category is the learned professional exemption. For an individual to qualify for learned professional exemption in addition to the salary requirement, 
the employee's primary duty must be the performance of work requiring advanced knowledge, which is defined as work that is predominantly intellectual in character and which includes work requiring the consistent exercise of discretion and judgment. The employee's advanced knowledge must be in a field of science or learning and the knowledge must be customarily acquired by a prolonged course of specialized intellectual instruction. So fields of science and learning, including law, medicine, theology, accounting, engineering, architecture, teaching, and various types of physical, chemical, and biological sciences, pharmacy, and other occupations that have a recognized professional status are generally recognized under this category. And then the last one we have is the creative professional exemption. To qualify for creative professional, the employee's primary duty must be the performance of work requiring invention, imagination, originality, or talent in a recognized field of artistic or creative endeavor. And then these requirements are generally met by actors, musicians, composers, writers, novelists, um, certain types of painters, and others as set forth in the regulations. Journalists may satisfy the duties requirements for the creative professional if their primary duty is work requiring invention, imagination, originality, or talent. Journalists are not exempt creative professionals if they only collect, organize, and record the information that is routine or already public, or if they do not contribute to a unique interpretation or analysis to a news product. And before we move on, I do want to talk about a few other white collar exemptions that are not impacted by the new ruling. The outside sales exemption is not impacted by this proposed change, as those who perform the jobs of an outside sales employee are already exempt from the minimum wage and overtime rules. The computer professional exemption is partially impacted, and let me explain what I mean. The computer professional is the only white collar exemption that allows an employer to pay either a salary or an hourly wage. If you're paying your computer professional an hourly wage of at least $27.63 and the employee meets the computer professional job duties test, you're not required to increase their hourly wage under the new proposed rule. However, if you're paying your computer professional a fixed salary, that salary will be impacted by the new proposed rule. When passed, your computer professional earning a salary must earn at least $6.79 a week to remain exempt from the overtime. And of course, this is in addition to meeting the job duties test for the computer professional. And then of course, in California, they already have a higher hourly and salary threshold than federal law, so those individuals will not be impacted. So let me speak briefly about the definition of discretion and independent judgment. What exactly does that mean? According to the DOL, it means that the employee has the freedom to make an independent choice free from immediate supervision or direction. You'll want to determine whether the employee has the authority to interpret or implement management policies or operating practices, whether the employee performs work that affects business operations to a substantial degree, and whether the employee has the authority to commit the employer in matters that have significant financial impact to the business. And then the term matters of significance means the level of importance or consequences of the work performed. An employee does not exercise discretion and independent judgment with respect to matters of significance, merely because the employer will experience a financial loss if the employee fails to perform these duties. So please understand the meanings of these terms when you're classifying your employees. So let's talk about what to do now. You do need to review all of your job descriptions to ensure the proper classification as exempt or non-exempt. Some of them are evident, but those that could be on the fence, you need to do your due diligence to ensure that you have them classified correctly. This is something that should be occurring anyway as a general HR audit performed on an annual basis because we know that in many organizations, job duties change frequently to keep up with business demands. And we spoke about discretion and independent judgment and matters of significance. Make sure the positions that you have classified as exempt display that level of autonomy and strategic thinking. It doesn't mean that these employees go unsupervised. It means that they are making decisions for your business that are more than merely following direction or procedures. They're using strategic and critical thinking skills to make decisions of importance for your business. Also, think about your overtime costs. 
if due to the new salary threshold, you need to reclassify some of your employees as non-exempt. If you do need to reclassify, determine how many hours per week they're averaging now, calculate what they will be, what they will cost you in overtime, and consider adjusting the rate of pay to average them out to what their current salary level is. Or you can analyze to determine if you can remove or reduce their overtime by removing non-essential tasks. But I know that's not always feasible. I, I think about some positions like social workers where working 40 or more hours a week is just a business necessity. So there's no getting around it. In such cases, employers may need to just absorb the overtime costs if they do need to reclassify due to the increase in the salary threshold. Also, don't forget to consider if you have any employer-sponsored benefits that define eligibility based on the employee status as exempt or non-exempt. This may include paid vacation or PTO policies and accrual rates or other benefits where the criteria is based on exempt and non-exempt status. And with regard to the new salary level, I know we briefly covered the inclusion of bonus or commissions. That's helpful, but if you're relying on that to meet the minimum salary threshold, remember that in essence, you're now guaranteeing that bonus or commission because it has to be paid in order to meet the exempt classification. And then I want to talk briefly about salary compression. This is a concern because we realize that we may be increasing the salaries of some of our employees who will now be earning closer to what their supervisors earn when their supervisor is generally managing a higher level of responsibilities. With pay transparency rules, the Equal Pay Act, and the National Labor Relations Act, employees are much more open about discussing their salaries than was the norm a decade ago. So it's easy for one individual to know what his peers or his subordinates are making. The key is that you want to be clear in your company's pay philosophy and be ready to answer questions as to why one individual is earning more or less than another. Your organization may need to consider providing a compression-related salary adjustment to managers or supervisors who have subordinates earning a salary much closer to that of their boss. Alternatively, you may consider a higher bonus or other variable pay component for your supervisors and managers where the salary gap has closed between them and their subordinates. The challenge is that there's really no one size fits all answer on how to most effectively manage this, but it's definitely a critical piece of the puzzle. And please note that ignoring salary compression often leads to low employee morale, turnover issues, stressed work relationships, and overall job dissatisfaction from those who see subordinates and less senior employees earning almost the same as them. So this is why it's important to craft your employee communications. Be prepared to answer employee questions about one, why one employee is exempt and the other is not, why one is earning more overtime and the other is not, and having pay grades and pay ranges is a benefit for employers because it gives you a guideline to have such conversations and ensure that your employees are being compensated fairly and within the ranges of the positions for which they are slotted. I'm now turning to the concept of joint employment. And in joint employment, uh, the regulations point out that a single individual may be an employee of two or more employers at the same time under the Fair Labor Standards Act, since there's nothing in the Act which prevents an individual employed by one employer from also entering into an employment relationship with a different employer. However, whether the employment by the two employers is to be considered joint employment or separate and distinct employment for purposes of the FLSA depends upon all of the facts in the particular case. And the case that most influences uh, this decision recently was issued uh, in 1983, uh, but the Department of Labor has decided to follow this 1983 decision in finding the appropriate factors. It's called Bonnet versus California Health and Welfare Agency. And in that case, there were chore workers who provided domestic in-home services to disabled public assistant recipients. And the issue was whether they were employed jointly by the individual recipients and by the state social service agency who was administering the program. And in reaching the conclusion that the chore workers were jointly employed by both the recipient of the help and by the state department, the court adopted four factors set forth in the district court opinion. 
because it said in varying combinations, these factors have been considered by other courts for the same purpose. Most importantly, these four factors are relevant as to whether or not someone is a joint employer. And the factors are, did the uh, state agency have the power to hire and fire the employees in the same way that the individual recipient of the services did? Did the state agency supervise and control employees' work schedules or conditions of employees? Did the state agency determine the rate and the method of payment? And did the state agency maintain employment records? And it found that it was undisputed that the true workers' wages were paid by the state agency. And in some cases, they were paid directly to the chore workers. In some cases, they were paid to the recipient of the services, but told, pay the workers. Uh, it's also undisputed that the, appellants control, uh, that the state agency controlled the rate and the method of pay, and that they maintained employment records. What was not clear was whether or not the state agencies had the direct power to hire and fire, but the court found that because they controlled the purse strings, they in effect had the power to hire and fire. So what did the Department of Labor do in 2019? It said, we like those four factors. We're going to use those four factors in defining henceforth what is a joint employer relationship. The only exception to that is we're not going to buy the state of California's federal court's finding that just because you have uh, a, something to do with the money or you have a reserve power to hire and fire that you're going to be a joint employer. Under the new rules set out by the Department of Labor in 2019, it buys the four Bonnet factors, but it says that the power to hire and fire has to be actual power and you have to exercise it in order to be considered a joint employer. So the Department of Labor issued this uh, new rule on April 1, and it's asking the public for its input uh, regarding that rule. But I wanted to point out some things that the department said in its, uh, what they call a preliminary statement about the rule. And that is, it says, the potential joint employer must exercise, directly or indirectly, one or more of these four factors to be jointly liable. The potential joint employer's ability, power, or reserve contractual right is not relevant. It said not only that, the following factors are not relevant. One, uh, just because an individual has a specialty job or a job that requires special skill, initiative, or judgment doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a joint employee. Uh, whether an individual has the opportunity for profit or loss based on his managerial skill doesn't decide joint employment. Um, moreover, if you as a putative joint employer tell somebody, um, well, I want you to pay these workers a, a wage floor, and I want you to have sexual harassment policies, and I want you to have workplace safety practices, and I want you to have morality clauses, and I want you to have general business practices. None of those factors, says the Department of Labor, creates a joint employment status. Similarly, it says, if you uh, provide uh, this uh, potential contracted worker, employer, a sample employee handbook or other forms that you want that uh, employer to use, it doesn't make you a joint employer. If you offer a, a health association plan, or a retirement plan, um, or uh, the opportunity to participate in benefits, it doesn't make you a joint employer. So I think that this uh, new rule is a step back from where the Department of Labor was going uh, during the uh, Obama administration's Department of Labor, and it's basically saying you are not going to be a joint employer unless you're telling the worker what to do you're hiring them, you're setting their pay, and you're keeping their employment record. Now, uh, why does it matter whether someone is a joint employer? Well, because if you have a contractual relationship with somebody and the issue is whether or not you're a joint employer of those employees of the con contractor, 
then what you have to do is you're responsible for making sure that the contractor has paid minimum wage and overtime to the contracted employees. So it matters to you whether you're a joint employer of your contractor's employees. Similarly, if you're a joint employer, you have to add together all the hours worked by the contracted employees between working for you and working for the contractor. And if that number is more than 40, then you're going to owe overtime at time and a half. So what can you do? Well, one of the things you can think about doing is indemnifying yourself. That is, in the contract you have with the contractor, you say, if I'm brought in as a joint employer, you, Mr. Contractor, will indemnify me and pay not only my legal expenses, but any, any monies that there are alleged that I owe. And that's one way of looking uh, at dealing with the joint employer issue. So I know that many of our clients are franchisees or staffing firms or employers working under a control group. Plus, we have clients who are in other business relationships where the joint employment rules are important. Employers should make the time to ensure that they understand the nature of their business relationships with related companies and to read through the contracts and agreements. Ask questions if you must. Be aware of how your business relationships are defined. Don't assume anything, have it in writing, and be sure that you have a clear understanding of the relationship and the liabilities. Make sure that whether you're the employer who payrolls the employee or the employer who supervises the work, that all employees under your control are being compensated under the wage and hour laws that are applicable to where the employees are working. Now we're going to slide over and talk about independent contractors and the gig economy. The gig economy is a free market system in which temporary positions are common and organizations contract with the independent workers for short-term engagement. The term gig is a slang word meaning a job for a specified period of time. And it is typically used in referring to musicians who have gigs. Examples of gig employees in the workforce could include freelancers, independent contractors, project-based workers, and temporary or part-time hires. The trend toward a gig economy uh, has been predicted to grow by 2020 to 40% of the American workers. These workers would be uh, agency temps, on-call workers, contract company workers, self-employed workers, or standard part-time workers. Some of the companies that use uh, the gig economy are Uber, Lyft, and Airbnb. And they are merging the temporary work arrangements of the gig economy with the sharing aspects of an online marketplace. There was a study done uh, by the University of Chicago's National Opinion Research Center that looked at the gig economy and looked to see how big it was. And if you look at the chart, you'll see that gig one is just independent contractors, consultants, and freelancers. And that has grown uh, from 2002 to 2014 from 18.9 to 20.5 million workers. Gig two includes all the gig one workers plus temporary agency workers and on-call workers. As you can see, that, grow, that grew from 22 million to 25 million in a 12-year period. And finally, gig, gig three, which is all the gig two workers plus contract company workers, has grown to almost 40, 30 million workers. In essence, it's projected that currently there are 14 to 23 percent of the workers are involved in the gig economy. But as I say, another study that I looked at called Intuit says it could be as many as 40 percent by 2020. So the gig economy is growing. What do you do about it? Well, essentially the gig economy is concerned with the independent contractor relationship. So you have to be sure that people that are in the gig economy but reporting to you are really independent contractors and for whom you then will give a 1099, or are they an, in, are they an employee? The United States Supreme Court has said many years ago, there's no single rule or test for determining whether an individual is an independent contractor or an employee. 
you look at a number of factors, and here are some of the factors that courts have looked at over the years. First, the extent to which the services rendered are an integral part of the principal's business. I, use, I like to use the example of a plumber. If your toilet breaks down, you call the plumber and they come in and fix the toilet. But fixing the toilet has nothing to do with the architectural business you're engaged in. But if you hire an independent contractor to, co to come in and draw designs for a shed or something related to the house, that could be an integral part of the principal's business. Another thing you look at is the permanency of the relationship. When I'm asked to evaluate whether somebody is an independent contractor or an employee, I usually say to the employer, how long have they worked here? And any time beyond six months is suspect to be more like an employee than an employer, excuse me, more than an independent contractor. Thirdly, I look at whether or not this person in the gig economy has invested some money in facilities and equipment. Then I look at the amount of control that the company is having over this independent contractor. Can they come in and do their job and not uh, take any direction or control from the employer? Then they're not going to be considered an employee. What about the opportunity for profit and loss? Can they make money depending upon what they're charged? Or do you so control the money and the time and the effort that they can't make any money uh, working for you? And then I look at the amount of initiative, judgment, or foresight um, that they have in an open market competition with others um, for their successful independent contract relationship. And finally, I look at the degree of the independent business organization and its operations. So these are some of the factors that courts have looked at in trying to determine whether someone is an independent contractor. Now, recently, three states have made it very difficult to classify workers as independent contractors. And that is called the ABC test. And those three states are California, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. And in those three states, with other states looking at this test, these are the factors that the state courts look at. One is the worker free from control and direction. Two is the worker performing work that's outside the usual course of a hiring entity's business. Again, it's like the plumber. If you're in the business of providing health care to the general public and you hire a plumber to come in and fix the toilet, they're not engaged in health care. But if you're providing health care and you hire a uh, PT or an occupational therapist or a doctor as an independent contractor, you won't meet the ABC test in Massachusetts, New Jersey, or California because those persons are engaged in health care. And finally, the worker has to be customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, or business as the same, of the same nature as the work they are performing. So that's the ABC test. If you've heard of it, it's being applied, and other states are looking at this test. As Ellen pointed out, the gig economy continues to grow, and it looks like it's going to be here to stay. There's definitely pros and cons to doing gig work, but the employer is ultimately responsible to ensure that the individual is correctly classified as the employee or independent contractor. This is regardless of what the individual wants or prefers. I know that in reality, both the gig worker and the employer may prefer to have the business relationship as a 1099 relationship, but legally, this can definitely backfire on the employer if the employer has the individual misclassified as a 1099 independent contractor. The general rule of thumb is that if the individual is performing services for your organization that is in line with the type of work generally performed by your employees, then the individual should be classified as an employee. And as Ellen noted, there is not a set definition for an independent contractor, and it's often interpreted by state law and the courts within those states. One misclassification could lead to a hefty penalties for the employer. The misclassification will apply to many employment law violations, including wage laws, overtime laws, meal and rest break laws when applicable, taxes, payroll liabilities, non-compliance of employee benefit regulations, violations of unemployment regulations, worker comp regulations, expense reimbursement laws, contract law, OSHA law, and LOA laws, leave of absence laws. 
For example, in California, we have California Labor Code, it's section 226.8. That law indicates that the penalty for willful misclassification of an individual as an independent contractor may include a penalty of between, excuse me, $5,000 and $15,000 per violation. A pattern or practice of misclassification in that state may cause a penalty of between $10,000 to $25,000 per violation. Plus, there may be personal liability to officers and directors who exercise operational control. And other states have similar significant penalties. So when we think about our gig workers, employers may choose to use them, but we must be sure that we're classifying them correctly based on the laws of the state where the services will be performed. So what should we do? Well, employers should review their current independent contractor relationships and agreements to determine whether any adjustments will need to be made and to make those adjustments promptly. Employers should also speak with counsel to determine the steps to take to mitigate the risks for employment-related wage claims or other claims related to the misclassification. This is definitely an important subject to stay on top of because we know that many employers in various industries have been using gig workers as a way to more efficiently run their businesses, but the laws do not provide any level of leniency to employers who willfully misclassify. So we're gonna segue over now and talk about tip workers. So there are two things that happen in the world of tip workers that you should know about. The first is that in 2018, in a federal spending bill, they included an amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act which provided that employers, managers, or supervisors cannot collect or retain tips that are earned by the employees regardless of whether or not the employer takes a tip credit. Tips received by the workers are the workers, and the employer cannot take them. Now, that doesn't mean they can't participate in a tip pool that is recognized under state law as lawful or under federal law as lawful, but the employer, the manager, or the supervisor cannot take that money. The second thing that has happened is that at the end of last year, the Department of Labor issued an opinion letter in which it looked at what's called related duties of the tipped employee. And the um, related duties are duties that are not tip generating, but are related to the tip generating work. And so this is how the uh, Department of Labor defines that. It says, such a situation as related work is that of a waitress who spends part of her time cleaning and setting tables, toasting bread, making coffee, and occasionally washing dishes or glasses. It's likewise distinguishable uh, from the counterman who prepares his own short orders or who, as part of a group of countermen, takes a turn as a short order cook for the group. Such related duties are part of a tipped occupation, and they. the question is, how much time can an employee spend on these related duties, and can you pay a tipped worker the tipped wage rate for performing these duties? And uh, so the Department of Labor at the end of 2018 said, we're going to do away with the rule that you can only spend 20% of your time on these related duties, and we're not going to have any amount of time that are spent. Instead, instead here's what they said. We do not intend to place a limitation on the amount of duties related to tip-producing occupations that may be performed, so long as these duties are performed contemporaneously with direct customer service duties. We also believe that guidance is necessary for an employer to determine on the front end which duties are related and which are unrelated to tip-producing occupations so that it can take necessary steps to comply with the FLSA. Accordingly, we believe that the determination that a particular duty is part of a tipped occupation should be made based on the following principles. One, duties listed as core or supplemental for the appropriate tip-producing occupation will be found in the Occupational Information Network, called o star Net which you can get online. And on the, in that uh, network system, they list core duties that are considered part of a tip-producing occupation. 
And then the second thing that the uh, uh, second thing is that employers may not take tip credit for time spent performing any tasks that are not contained in the O-net task list. And it says, we note that some time spent by a tipped employee performing tasks that are not listed on O-net may be subject to the de minimis rule contained in the wage and hours general regulations. So in the slide that's before you, we say the wage and hour division will no longer prohibit an employer from taking a tip credit based on the amount of time an employee spends performing duties relating to a tip-producing occupation that are performed contemporaneous with direct customer service duties or for a reasonable time immediately before or immediately after performing such direct service. Now, state laws are also part of the, uh, part of the issue here for those who have tip workers. And it's very important that you as an employer make sure that you're following the state tip law rule. And uh, oftentimes the state uh, minimum wage is higher, so therefore the tip credit is higher in that state. At no time, however, can any employee earn less than the tip credit plus the actual tips received to make the, tip, the minimum wage for uh, minimum wage for that state. States can allow tip pooling, but generally only the tips employees keep after the pooling apply to the tip credit, and only permitted among employees who regularly and customarily receive tips. So some ways to ensure that you are compliant is particularly for those of you in industries where tipping is um, customary in your business. Most importantly, ensure that your tipped workers are earning at least the minimum wage for all hours worked. I know we've been stressing that these last two few slides. It's very important. Generally, employers may apply a tip credit when permitted by state law, and generally tip pooling is permitted with some limitations as defined by state law. Ensure that those employees included in your tip pool practices are those who customarily and regularly receive tips. If you're in the restaurant or hospitality industry, or if you're in the gaming industry, check your state's Department of Labor website to see what the tip rules are specific to those industries. As we mentioned, the tip rules vary by state. What we're really covering here is the DOL change that occurred in 2018, but state by state, the tip rule laws may vary, so take a look at that based on what state your employees are performing services. Now let's talk a little bit more about equal pay initiatives. So the federal regulations govern uh, most federal laws. Most federal laws say uh, we will assign to the agency a, uh, who will follow this law the responsibility for drafting regulations. And one of the things that the Equal Employment Opportunity Agency did was to begin requiring pay data as of March of 2019. And hopefully, I think what they're going to use the pay data for is to determine whether there's any significant differences between men and women in pay. Now, they already know that women only make 82% uh, of a male salary. So it'll be interesting to see what they're going to do with the pay data uh, that they've begun to collect again. Another thing that happened is that the National Labor Relations Board uh, issued some regulations that said employees must be permitted to discuss wages and other working conditions among themselves without being disciplined. And following that, many state laws added the same rules. There was a case in California in 2018 that held that an employer cannot justify a wage differential between male and female employees by relying on prior salary. Now, what is that prior salary all about? Well. In the past couple of years, at least 20 states have issued a salary history ban that pro prohibits uh, employers from using the past salary history of an employee to set the initial salary history at the new workplace. So in Massachusetts, for example, if you're applying for a new job, the employer may not ask you how much you've been paid in the past until they make you a job offer that includes compensation. And employers cannot refuse to consider you for a job based on how much you earned at your last job. And finally, employers generally cannot prohibit you 
from talking about either your own wages or your coworkers' wages. So in summary, make sure that you're familiar with the equal or comparable pay laws of the states where you have employees working. Take a look at your employment applications, and if they include salary inquiries and your state prohibits that, remove it. If you have one employment application for multiple states, it's wise to just remove the salary info altogether as a best practice and don't ask about current or past salary. It's also wise to get yourself into the habit now as we will see this pattern occurring in more and more states. Train your managers to not ask about current or past salary, but rather they can discuss the salary and total comp package for the position they're interviewing for. They can ask if the comp package offered is in the candidate's range, or they can ask the candidate what salary range the candidate is looking for. A well-qualified candidate is going to know the market range and would make a reasonable suggestion. Take a look at your, your current salary structure for similar or same positions. While there are certain justifiable reasons why one employee may earn more than another, ensure that it's for a justifiable business reason and not due to an individual's protected class or based on what the employee was earning at their past employer, and make any necessary adjustments in, as found within your audit. And that pretty much wraps up the brunt of our conversation. I know that we covered a lot of material. I know that most of it is at a um, federal level, but again, many state laws do vary. So take a look at state laws. Give us a call on the advisor hotline if you have additional questions. And we wanna just give you some key takeaways from what we discussed today. So know the federal and state laws that apply to your organization. Review the employee classifications and revise as necessary and follow the DOL, the EEOC, and other agency processes or proposals, and learn more by following our blog or by take, uh, talking to one of us on the live hotline. Rachel? Thank you so much, Ellen and Renee. This is extremely informative, and I hope that everybody um, got a lot out of this that they can use. Um, I do want to mention we've got a great takeaways document in the resources box that has more information on these topics, a checklist to go off of, and links to more information. So uh, you're going to keep an eye on the Q&A box for the Sherman HRCI codes. I'll be putting those up in just a moment. We'll also send you a certificate of completion, including the codes, to all of our live attendees. We're going to finish up right on time, but if you want to stay on for about five minutes after, we're going to answer some of the great questions received. First, I want to give you a super quick plug for uh, Think HR's People Risk Management Solution. Uh, so as you know, employees are your number one risk and your number one investment. Um, people risk is inevitable, but organizational behaviors and responses can either mitigate or accelerate that risk. This is where people risk management comes in. It fills a critical need for businesses of all sizes, helping you to build and maintain a strong culture, drive employee engagement performance, and help to reduce the risk of uh, you know, compliance and people-related risks that exist in every organization. So um, it's no small fee, um, but we do provide a variety of products that you've already come to know and trust including our Living Handbook, Comply Library, our Learn Training Program, our Live Advisors, Benefits Document Creator, um, and our insights, including our blog, our webinars, our newsletters, other ways that we can keep you up to date so you know everything you need to know. If you want to know more about the case for people risk management, download our white paper from thinkhr.com slash PRM. The URL is on the slide. So, um, one final thing, we do have a survey that will pop up. So if you could please take that, let us know um, how you like this webinar and what you, we can learn more about. So um, we have time for just a couple of questions that we got in from the audience. So let me take a quick look through them. Um, so um, here's one with Point employment, um, I guess it's a good one for Ellen. What's the biggest change in the new regulation? The biggest change in the um, joint employer regulation, in my opinion, is that there's a real halt to expanding joint employer to franchise situations, to uh, many other uh, contracted agency situations, and it really goes back and just 
says, stop, you aren't a joint employer unless you actually tell the worker what to do. And that was a, a big surprise for me that they would uh, go back that far and make it that explicit. Uh, in the white collar regulations uh, area, uh, the biggest surprise to me was that they did not uh, in any way look at the duties test. They left the duties test alone. So that just means that they're going to stick with primary duties, uh, at least in the future. Thank you. Okay. Um, we've got a lot of questions on the white collar regulation. Um, here's one for Renee. Can an employee earn more than $35,308 and still be non-exempt? And the answer is a definite yes. The 35308 is merely the minimum threshold to be exempt from overtime. However, in addition to that, as we spoke about in our slides, they have to meet the job duties test. That's equally important. So an individual can easily earn more than 35308 and still be a non-exempt employee earning overtime because they don't meet the job duties test. So it's the two prongs together, salary of at least 30308 35308 and the job duties test. They can easily still remain as non-exempt because of failing that job duties test. Thanks, Renee. Um, here's one for Ellen. Uh, what happens at the end of the Department of Labor 60-day comment period? Um, I think that's in regards to the white collar regulations. Yes, the department is re required under the Administrative Procedure Act to review all comments that it receives, to assess them and to accept or to reject them, and then it must issue a final rule, and uh, the final rule must have an accompanying document that says, we looked at these regulations, excuse me, we looked at these comments, and here's how we respond to those comments. Uh, once the final rule is issued, then persons who don't agree with it can file a case in court saying that the final rule is unlawful and should be rejected by the courts. That's what happened in 2016. My assessment is that that will not happen this time because um, basically because the Department of Labor stuck with what happened in 2004 in terms of its methodology and the uh, data that it looked at, and I think that will give it cover. Uh, should any lawsuit, in fact, be filed, but I don't think any will. Great. Um, okay, I think we've got time for two more questions. I'm going to uh, the first one to Ellen, the next one to Renee. So for Ellen, um, with respect to the white collar regulations, do you anticipate there will be litigation around them like there was for the 2016 proposal? I do not anticipate there will be. As I just mentioned, I think that the fact that they stuck with what happened in 2004 and followed it practically to the T. Uh, I think that adds cover to the Department of Labor, and so therefore there will not be any litigation like there was in 2016. Also in 2016, the salary level jumped from 455 to 917, almost a double or more than double, and so that added uh, some rationale for alleging that the salary level was unlawful. That didn't happen this time. Great. Okay, so final question. This one's for Renee. Are there exceptions for business owners who earn a salary? There is, and that's on a federal level. So again, you want to check your state laws. So under the federal regulations, there is a special rule for business owners. Under the rule, an employee who owns at least a bona fide 20% equity interest in the business, regardless of the type of business, and who's actively engaged in its management, is considered to be a bona fide exempt executive. The DOL has a fact sheet that discusses this, and you can take a look at what's called Fact Sheet 17B, B as in boy, for more information. And But then again, also check your state laws. Great. Oh, thank you very much, Ellen and Renee. I hope that um, everybody who is on our webinar today got as much out of this as I did. And uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to call our live team, look at our Comply Library. We've also written a lot about uh, the latest developments on our blog. If you subscribe to the blog, you can get up updated emails, letting us know, uh, letting you know when we've got something new. So again, thank you very much, and we look forward to having you on our next webinar in June.
Thank you, ThinkHR team, for providing us with some great content today. One of the great ways that you will be able to know more about the federal and state laws that apply to your organization and be able to review employee classifications and information from the Department of Labor and the EEOC is by utilizing PrimePay's HR advisory services. Our free version is provided to all of our clients and delivers on comprehensive web content, handbook builders, five employee training courses, and other tools and resources to help your business. Upgrade to HR Advisory Advanced for only $29 per month. This subscription adds on state-level handbooks, over 200 learning courses for your employees, and enables a certified HR Live team who can provide written responses to your complex issues. Visit the links on the screen to learn more. As follow-up to today's webinar, please look out for the following. A link to the recording, a copy of the presentation slide deck, plus additional resources that bring to life what was presented today. Thank you for joining our webinar. Head to our events page on primepay.com to get more details of our upcoming webinars. This will conclude our webinar. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day.